On Life and Times tonight, we'll look at the local political races that could tip the balance of power in Washington. If you wonder how high the political stakes are in California, just look at Republican Jim Rogan and Democrat Adam Schiff. Theirs is the most expensive congressional race ever, and there's more money where that came from. The Democrats need seven to pick up seven House seats to be able to control, and they're targeting four Republican seats right here in California, hoping to pick up four of the seven. And on tonight's Thinker Shakers and Newsmakers, a woman forced into sexual slavery during World War II is turning her pain into art. And what is it like to live inside a refugee camp? Well, there are millions of refugees around the globe. Now the refugee experience comes home to Los Angeles. These stories coming up next on Life and Times Tonight. Life and Times Tonight is made possible by the following foundations. The James Irvine Foundation, which is dedicated to the development of an informed California citizenry. And the L.K. Whittier Foundation, dedicated to improving the quality of life by supporting innovative endeavors in the fields of medicine, health, science, and education. Good evening, I'm Val Zavala. Our top story tonight, it's the second biggest political fight of the year. Who will control Congress, the Democrats or the Republicans? That contest is spending its way through Southern California, but it's not as much about money as it is about power. Tonight, Philip Bruce takes a look at the key races that have turned California into a major battleground state. L.A. South Bay is a place where the good life is regularly on display. It's laid back and upscale, not exactly an area you describe as a battleground. But that's exactly what towns like Manhattan Beach have become the scene of a scorched earth battle in one of the toughest congressional races in the country. The fight between Democrat Jane Harmon and Republican Steve Kuykendall. Steve is not a Johnny come lately. He's lived here for 25 years. He, he knows the things that people in, in his district are concerned about. He's willing to step out and take positions. He works hard. He believes very much in the communities he represents. Steve Kuykendall has been active here on the peninsula. Jane Harmon, on the other hand, has never lived in the community, has never participated in any of the community events here on the peninsula. Among other things, it's a battle of the airwaves. Republicans are spending big bucks trying to keep Kuykendall in the seat he won two years ago after Jane Harmon resigned from Congress to launch an unsuccessful bid for governor. Now Harmon's back, and the Democrats are spending just as much trying to give her her old job. The race for Congress in the South Bay comes down to priorities. Steve Kuykendall voted for an irresponsible trillion dollar tax cut that left no money to improve schools, strengthen Social Security or Medicare, or even reduce the debt. I'm Jane Harmon. I've got different priorities, and my record shows it. Most of the pollsters say the race could go either way. That's why both parties are pumping huge resources into the South Bay. By Election Day, the two candidates are expected to spend $4 million. That's a lot of cash for a relatively small race but it's all part of a high-stakes numbers game that'll decide who runs Congress. And it's why Democrats have targeted Steve Kuykendall. This uh, district is a true bellwether district. How this district uh, goes we may be very important as to you know, how the presidential race goes. Alan Hoffenblum is a veteran political analyst, former Republican operative, and now publisher of a nonpartisan political newsletter called the California Target Book. He says a battle between Kuykendall and Harmon bears strong resemblance to the race between Bush and Gore, a near-dead heat that'll be decided not by Republicans and Democrats, but by a solid core of independent voters. What you have is about a 15% independent vote. These are people who registered decline the state. These are uh, 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 voters who tend to be less ideological, really don't give a hoot which political party con controls Congress. And how they vote for president could be very decisive of how they vote for Congress. If Bush carries that congressional seat, that's good for Kuykendall. If Al Gore carries that congressional seat, you know, uh, that's good for Jane Harmon. Then there's a race between Jim Rogan, the Republican congressman from Glendale, and Adam Schiff, the Democratic state senator from Pasadena. It's already the most expensive congressional contest in history. 
nearly $10 million between the two candidates, with more money on the way if it's needed. Rogan is at the top of the Democrats' hit list after helping lead the impeachment drive against Bill Clinton. But there's another reason he's being targeted. Democrats know the political ground has shifted in Glendale and other parts of Rogan's San Gabriel Valley District. Once a mostly white Republican stronghold, it's now rapidly becoming more diverse and more liberal. Democrats believe that works in their favor and opens Rogan to being picked off in November. I mean, here you have Jim Rogan, who is, in my opinion, is a decent man, but very, very conservative in terms of the issues that he supports. And you have a district that is moving more toward the center. So you have Rogan out on the right, the district is in the center, and here's Adam Schiff, who's already there in the center. So in terms of the luck and timing, it's with Adam Schiff in this particular election cycle. Still, the race is widely regarded as too close to call. Dick Rosengarten, publisher of the nonpartisan weekly newsletter Cal Peak, says it's another contest that could be influenced heavily by how the 27th district votes for president. Together, the rogan Schiff race and the kuykendall harman battle represent two of the key political fights that will decide whether Republicans retain control of the House. Uh, I think Rogan, uh, rogan Schiff and harman Kuykendall. Uh, Democrats are counting on winning them both. I think that's, um, that's a stretch, I think, you know, because I, I think that the harman Kuykendall race is still very much of a toss-up. Besides the battles in the San Gabriel Valley and the South Bay, Democrats are hoping to pick up seats in two more California races. They've targeted Republican incumbent Brian Bilbray in San Diego, who's in a close fight with Democrat Susan Davis. And in San Jose, the 15th district seat is up for grabs after Republican Congressman Tom Campbell stepped down to run for the Senate against Dianne Feinstein. Those four races, yeah, they could tip the balance if the Democrats could win them all. Will they win them all? If I, if I had to to bet my firstborn? The answer is no, I wouldn't do it. It's just too close, it's too chancy. In the meantime, Democrats are worried about holding on to a California congressional seat they already have. Cal Dooley, who represents the Central Valley from Fresno to Bakersfield, is in the fight of his life against Republican Rich Rodriguez, a popular local TV newsman. Alan Hoffenblum says Rodriguez's high visibility and Latino heritage are two things that are giving Republicans an edge in that heavily Latino district. Now, in past elections, they have voted overwhelmingly for Democratic. And the Republicans recruited the Rodriguez, hoping that he could get a substantial number of Latino voters to cross over and vote for him. And if they're successful in doing that, he could very well win that seat. Boy, I didn't realize that California was such an important state in terms of tipping the balance here. Well, you know, if you look at the math, Val, the uh, Democrats need seven, they need to pick up seven seats to take control of the House. They're looking at four of them in California, right so here. clearly that says how important the state is. But I do agree with the expert that you interviewed there, that the chances of the Democrats winning all four very close races is just by odds. And plus there's also the chance that they, the Democrats could lose some seats, like you saw the race up in uh, the Central Valley with the, well, the Democrats. I had not heard anything about that well, one. Well, Cal Dooley had been a Democrat. It was pretty popular up there, and the Republicans had continued to lose in that district because it was increasingly Latino. The Republicans went out looking for an attractive Latino candidate, and they found him on the local news. He was a, an anchorman of a leading newscast there in Fresno. They encouraged him to run. This is Rich Rodriguez's first time to run for political office. And some people in Los Angeles may remember him a long time ago. He was a sportscaster over at KTLA, so he has had some roots down here as well. That's it. Obviously, he had to step down from his job in order to run. He stepped down at the first part of this year and has been campaigning ever since. And what you're seeing in all of these races is not only local money coming in to, to funnel in uh, to all the campaigns, you're seeing national campaign money coming in in a big way, especially in the Rogan Schiff race and the race down on the South Bay. The Democrats and the Republicans have so much at stake in these races, and all kinds of national money from all kinds of sources is coming in. Because they are hoping to help tip the race. So they look at the close races and they say, that's where we're going to put our money. If our, our national organization looks you, at how close it is. You want to see what's a good investment. In the Rogan Schiff mm -hmm. race, for example, Jim Rogan has never won by more than 51%. This is a tough year for him because of the impeachment issue and also because of the shifting demographics. The Democrats believe they can knock him off, and they're spending a ton of money to do it. 10 million. Woo. We'll be watching these on election night. Thank you so much, Philip. Our top story tomorrow, just how far out of the box is the Compton School District willing to go? How about hiring baby principals?
certain things like when I walked in and I saw, oh, oh I'm in the principal's office, like things like that just started clicking as I was in, I'm like, oh, I forgot I would have an office. That's tomorrow on Life and Times Tonight at 7 p.m. Sexual slavery is one of the stories of World War II that history has seemed to overlook. Japanese soldiers captured Korean girls and used them as sex slaves. Today, former so-called comfort women still suffer from the memories. They don't talk much about what happened, but words aren't always necessary in the way they express their pain, as we'll see in tonight's Thinkers, Shakers, and Newsmakers. <laughs> Joining us now is Soon Do Kim. She is a former comfort woman. She uses art to show us what she went through, as well as a means of therapy. Also joining us is her interpreter, Yoon Suk Lee. Thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Lee and Ms. Kim. First, I want to tell the audience a little bit about what Ms. Kim went through, because this part is hard for her to talk about. She was kidnapped, captured at age 16 by Japanese soldiers, taken to a Japanese soldier's camp, um, for three years, they were exploited, raped, sometimes by as many as 40 soldiers. And the only reason she got out, if I understand correctly, was that a very high-level Japanese officer helped her leave or escape or let her go. So what, how on earth do you even begin to recover? What happened to her after that? Did she go home? Did she live a normal life? What happened after that? 할머니 그 40년 때 그때 음. 그 한국 다시 돌아갔잖아요. 네. 그 다음에 할머니 어떻게 살고 있는 거 알고 싶었는데요. 음, 그 다음에 예. 그 다음에 에, 가진 내 동일 다 해가면서 어, 살았다고. Well, 음. basically, she struggled um, to make a living and had a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. Did she ever marry or have children? 할머니 결혼하셨어요? 아니면 애 낳았어요? 네, 애기 낳았어요. 예. She had a uh, she, had an an had egg in she did not marry, um, but she did have children. Mm -hmm. And were you able to be around other women, comfort women, who had gone through this? Were you able to help each other? 그 할머니는 다른 정신대 할머니와 같이 어떻게 서로 서로 도와주고 뭐 그런 경험 있어요? 네, 있어요. 예, 좀 음. 얘기 좀 해주세요. 네. 예, 광주군 태천면에. 할머니들이 나눔의 집이라고 하는 이 집이 열한 명 할머니들이 같이 살고 있어요. 그래 서로 서로 어, 돕고 그렇게 살고 있어요. She resides in the house of sharing, which is in Gwangju, which is about an hour and a half away from Seoul. It's a communal home for former comfort women. There are eleven former comfort women there, and they provide each other with emotional support. But they're also very active in trying to um, gain justice. 해진 스님이 원장 스님으로 계시고. And the person in charge is Monk Hijin. We're going to take a look at some of the artwork that the women have done. Why don't we take a look at the first picture and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what we're seeing. I mean, we could in Pomen's there, some summon come into one there. Yeah, yeah. Yogi Appe's life before the capture? How many Yogi Appe's there? Oh, eh. Joganon, just Songi Bosso Tanum Gonde, just Songi Bosso Tasso Il Jeshite. Oh, yeah. This is called colonial mushroom taxation. It's partly, uh, it's, it's bitter memories, I mean mixed memories. One is about remembering childhood of uh, picking mushrooms, but it's also mushrooms that the family not only consumed, but also mushrooms that they had to give to the Japanese uh, okay, government. Okay, let's see the next one here. Tom you. This was life also before the capture, yes? This <laughs> 물레 차서 이제 저거 배 매는 거예요. Also 저거. memories of childhood weaving hemp cloth and mm -hmm. that cloth was used for Korean uh, clothes mm -hmm. and other um, supplies. Okay, and we'll see the next one. 저거는 이제 소 이제 산 속에서 소 매기는 소풀 매기는 그 장면을 내가 어린 시절에 했기 때문에 and 저렇게 그랬어요. She compares 그랬습니다. her life uh, of hard work as to that of a cow or an ox, and she worked mm -hmm. as hard as that. Even so, life was difficult as a child, but yeah. was she basically happy as a child? Um, 지금 그때 어릴 때요 힘들지만요 기뻤어요. 어렸을 때요. 예. 어렸을 때에는 그저 뭐 기쁘고 자고 일제 시대 때니까 매일 저렇게 일을 해야 먹고 살고 벗었다고. They were living under Japanese colonial period, oh, uh, working um, especially because she was grew in grew up in poverty. I see. Yeah. 
But everything changed. I think this is the moment when her whole life changed. 음, 저거는 우리나라 지도 안에 선 여자를 지도 밖으로 일본 사람 손이 이렇게 끌어갔다고 다른 나라. Who was grabbing her out of the Korean Peninsula right behind her? And did they literally just find her working and and? 어떻게 할머니 찾았어요? 그 미국 군 일본 군인들요? 일본 군인을 어떻게 찾았느냐고? 예, 할머니 어떻게 끌은 거요? 그 정신대학이요. 어, 그러니까 일본으로 간다고 하고 처음에 그 전혀 공투리라고 해서 갔는데 일본으로 임시 간호원이라고 해서 갔는데 에, 일본이 아니고. Yeah. 중국 상해 저렇게 배 타고 가서 상해 가서 내렸어. This is called kidnap ship, and that's related to how she was taken away. Um, basically, she thought she would be a nurse um, in the in Japan, but instead the boat le uh, ended up in Shanghai, where she became comfort woman for the Japanese troops that actually moved towards Nanking during the massacre. I see. So there was some deception involved. Let's yeah. take a look at the next one. 다음 그림요. Now this 아, is a little. 이거는 이제 그 처음에 가니까. 군인들이 막 아주 많이 저렇게 나라별 해서서 오니까 무서워 가지고 보지도 못하고 부들부들 떨고 저렇게 In that place at that time this is the first time she was raped and you can see soldiers lining up to um, rape her and she's naked and she's lying in a fetal position and she didn't want to see their face so she covered her face and that's her memory of what happened And she was there for three years? Yes That must have been terrible Now this picture shows after the 저거는 camp. 이제 어, 17살 때 가시니까 이제 저걸 그림을 그려가지고 그 위에 yeah. 봉우라지 맺은 거를 못 잡힌 옷이라고. Actually, this was called a and it's when she, at the age of 16, when she was taken, she saw herself as a flower that could not blossom before they took her away. Wow. And the next one here? 이거는 이제 저 중국 할머니를 이제 우리나라 지도 아니 그래서 이렇게 만나는 장면. Oh, so this is a reunion with other comfort women. Former comfort women from North Korea, China, and so on. That would be her hope or dream. And we should mention that Miss Kim's artwork and the artwork of other comfort women have been brought together in a beautiful book here called Unblossomed Flower: A Collection of Paintings by Former Military Comfort Women. And um, I also understand there is a lawsuit pending yes, by the comfort women and against the Japanese Japanese government, government under U.S. Uh, civil law, civil courts, yes, criminal courts. So hopefully they will get some kind of justice or yes. reckon. Thank you so much. I know it's a very <laughs> painful <laughs> thing to speak about, but we <laughs> very, very much appreciate <laughs> your sharing your experience <laughs> with us. Well, you can check the number on your screen for more information on Sun Duk Kim's artwork. It is on display at the Lotus Art Gallery in Los Angeles through October 25th. And she is also speaking at UCLA next Monday about her experience. So what's your response to Ms. Key's, Kim's experience or the effort to get justice? We'd love to hear what you think about that or any of the stories we cover here on Life and Times tonight. And here are the ways you can contact us.